let's get a little bit contentious. I wanted to talk a little bit about my favorite RPGs of all time, a list that will inevitably piss people off because I left off one game or another, maybe because I didn't like them or more likely because I haven't played them. A list that will really upset people because I didn't put Witcher 3 on it. Tell me why not, is it the scars? Or Chrono Trigger. I'm like pre-gaming the, the upset at this point. Like I'm just like, you know, just like we're preparing you for this list, especially when I get to the, the one that number five. Hmm. But honestly, it's all valid. All that anger and frustration is valid because even when I was trying to make this list, when I was trying to think of just five RPGs, I ended up mad at myself. I ended up mad at myself with my final list because how could I leave off Neverwinter Nights? How could I not include Final Fantasy X, an RPG that meant so much to me? Honestly, what's wrong with me? Well, it's because making a top five list of a, a genre and games that you love is difficult because normally you love a genre because there's a hell of a lot more than five of those games that you love for different reasons. Some of those reasons may be because they, they arrived at a certain point in your life because they have this intrinsic like value to you as a person because of what they meant to you, what kind of how what kind of escapism they offered and when. And that's definitely like what my number five is. I think in general, just they just they just can't suck. The games just can't suck if they're gonna be in the top five. But that's enough of me yammering on. Let's actually talk about the top five games. With the fifth pick, I really wanted to add a game that was personal to me and perhaps a little bit unexpected. One of those that wouldn't be on many people's lists, if, if really any, but meant a lot to me. Hell, at first, I was even considering adding Legend of Lagaya, the JRPG, to this list as number five because of how much that RPG meant to me personally when I first played it. But I went with a slightly different game. Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance. Released in 2001 from Snowblind and Interplay, Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance is a spin-off of the main Baldur's Gate series and counts two games to its name, as well as similar games in the EverQuest IP, Champions of Norath 1 and 2. It's a real-time action RPG with top-down perspective that takes place on the Sword Coast of Faerun, starting in the famous city of Baldur's Gate. But unlike the other games, the companions you would find in this game would only be your friends if you managed to do co-op, and you wouldn't actually create your own character. Still, Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance very quickly introduces you to the Elf Song Tavern, a diabolical plot complete with rats, undead, early 2000s era villains, and maybe even a beholder or two. It's a very solid ARPG with surprisingly engaging combat and a story you want to unfold. While the sequel may have improved on just about every aspect of the first game, from the combat to its storytelling, this has to take the fifth spot largely because of how it got me into not just gaming, but RPGs. In a lot of ways, this is kind of where it all started. But perhaps best of all, it was ported to PC 20 years after it launched on console back in 2021 by Black Isle Studios, so you can now actually grab it on Steam if you want to play it and you never have. The one downside here is that the game is best as a co-op ARPG, and unfortunately that's a bit more difficult, especially without online co-op. It still stands as one of my favorite games of all time though, with a satisfying RPG gameplay loop of gearing up, getting stats, and plowing ahead with a, through a world-changing narrative. It's also one of the only games out there that's actually good and not just using the name Dungeons & Dragons, where you can play as Drist Do Erden because you can do so by going through a kind of like going through all the difficulty modes. It really, Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance had a new game plus before that was really a thing, I guess. But this next game, this next game, number four on the list. This one actually probably is on almost all of your lists. And the only gripe might actually be just how low I have it. Diablo 2. Honestly, this fourth spot was tough. I considered a few games here, like Jade Empire, which got a nod. So did Mass Effect. Even other ARPGs in the same vein, like Titan Quest, popped into my head. 
but I couldn't rightfully release this video without this ARPG on the list, especially when I snuck a Dark Alliance into it. What more do I need to say about Diablo 2 than it was the epitome of peak Blizzard? Alongside Warcraft 3, which would launch two years later, this was an era where Blizzard was putting out epic hits with incredible storytelling and fantastic gameplay loops. Diablo 2 especially stood out to me as in some ways it felt kind of adjacent to another genre that I loved so much at the time, the MMO. It was essentially an RPG that was online. You could trade with other players and do things like that that I didn't know was a possibility in a single player RPG. But Diablo 2 allowed that. They created a whole ladder system. They created the modern day idea of what an ARPG could be by putting this new world together and really following up their original entry of Diablo and just kind of improving on almost everything. Diablo 2 for many people stands out as perhaps the best ARPG of all time and that's perhaps why they were so eager to make a Diablo 2 Resurrected which holds up extremely well if you want to actually give that game a try now. But the funniest thing about this, about me having Diablo 2 on this list, is I am actually not the ideal player for Diablo 2. I am much more interested in just having a single story and being done. I'm not interested in grinding gear or even really like the power fantasies that go along with a Diablo 2 or really a ARPG style game. I'm much more interested in like compelling stories that I really want to get immersed in that narrative. So it's a little bit interesting that, you know, I, I found so much enjoyment in Diablo 2 back then when I first started playing it. And I do think for me, it was that that slight, slight tenuous, tenuous connection to the MMORPG genre. Because at the time I was playing a shit ton of EverQuest. I was definitely not a power player of Diablo 2. So far, we already have two ARPGs on the list. And the th funny thing is, is ARPGs actually aren't really my genre. So I think we really need to change it up a bit with this next one. And this spot, the third spot, actually had the most changes in the list when I was writing the script. Like physical changes, like I wrote in one name and then I erased it and then I added in a new name over and over and over again. It could have been Jade Empire. It could have been Neverwinter Nights. Final Fantasy X had a nod in this spot. Fable was in here. Morrowind was here. Even Oblivion got a nod here. But there's one game that just made sense. Hey, you, you're finally awake. I have to give this spot to Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. Skyrim was something special when it released. It was a moment in many ways, not unlike when Baldur's Gate 3 released recently, where RPG fans united around the joys of the game. Something that you may not fully remember now, but it really was a, a moment where people just got together and really just loved the game. Skyrim was an incredible game at the time. It did so much and it did it really well. It was an RPG that I sunk a ton of hours into and I never finished the final story. I don't think I even got close to finishing the final story. I will never forget the first time I got attacked by a damn dragon. And this was coming off enjoying two prior Elder Scrolls titles myself in Oblivion and Morrowind, both of which made me see what could be done with an RPG. Skyrim, like some of the others on this list, doesn't really need to be explained. It is just a known quantity. From wheels of cheese to giants to one of the most extensive mod scenes I have ever seen. It's a game that arguably is Bethesda at its best, but it's also Bethesda resting too long on their laurels. After all, it released back in 2011, and Elder Scrolls 6 is still just a glimmer in Todd Howard's eye. But it was a great RPG that has long since been prolonged by the dedication of a community of modders who have transformed it over the years, at least as many times it has been released as an anniversary edition by Bethesda, trying to make sure that you know that yes, you can actually return to Skyrim on every single platform everywhere always at all times because there's at least 15 different side quests that you still haven't beaten and at least 10 different bugs for you to discover that will probably make you laugh a little bit. Wait, I know you. The only mistake was you showing your face. That's something I'm supposed to deliver. 
I read on the internet that our games have had a few bugs. <laughs> I did. I read it on the internet, so it's true. <laughs> and that uh, sometimes it doesn't just work. Now, as we get to the top two, these top two games, there wasn't any consideration here. For all the other spots, they were like, okay, I can swap in this game, I can swap in that one. And there's games that even as I record this now, I legitimately feel bad about not including and wish that I had changed them out. Maybe put in a different game for a spot three or four, or even the fifth spot. But these two, the top two, they were set in stone the moment I decided to make this video. They are in a different league when it comes to RPGs for me. And my number two actually used to be my number one. Dragon Age Origins was my number one RPG for well over a decade. It was a game that I so fondly remember despite being quite bad at it because I found the story so compelling, so inviting, and so revolutionary at the time it launched. It remains in many ways the epitome of a CRPG to me, and it did what other RPGs hadn't in the past. It made me care about the characters within the world. Years later, I still remembered Alistair and Morrigan, something that couldn't be said for others. In part, this may simply be a visual thing, as this game introduced me to a more cinematic RPG experience. But a lot has to be said about the writing in the game. When I revisited DAO years later, I fell in love all over again, but for different reasons. Despite the frequent crashes playing it on PC at harder difficulties, I really began to thoroughly enjoy and appreciate the depth and complexity of combat within the game. It's built upon the architecture of many older games, including those by Bioware themselves like Baldur's Gate 1 and 2. A kind of thing that Bioware over the past has kind of gone away from. The Dragon Age Origins is not the kind of game that Bioware will continue to make. But interestingly enough, there might be a small French studio that's actually kind of taking up the mantle a little bit. But more about that in just a little bit. First, we have to talk about number one. What RPG could possibly dethrone Dragon Age Origins? I saved you. And I'm here to save you again. Baldur's Gate 3 feels like a generational RPG. It's kind of like what Skyrim felt like in 2011, but larger. So much of it feels that way. Not necessarily in size or side quests or things like that. In fact, it's quite the opposite. But how they pushed the CRPG genre into a full cinematic experience. The context of Larian making the game in the open for years and still being underrated, then going on to sweep awards and earn an insane number of them. This is all heightened even more by Larian's boss, Sven Vinka's passionate defense of developers in a challenging game environment, of self-inflicted wounds where it seems like no dev was safe from potential layoffs to please investors. Larian has already made some great games before this. Divinity Riddle Sin 2 alone was worthy of this list. But with Baldur's Gate 3, its deep tactical combat, its sprawling story with insane amounts of choice, and so many damn failsafes to deal with that choice that they even had to rely on a damn fish to keep the story going. 
it set a new standard for companion stories and cinematics that perhaps won't be topped until another mega budget RPG comes along like Mass Effect 5, or perhaps the next RPG is coming from Larian Studios, of which we are going to get two. Well, they're not necessarily going to be both RPGs, but they're working on two games. As I look over this list of fantastic RPGs that I have loved so much, and all the ones that I had to take off the list because I just didn't have room for them, I'm thankful of how many great RPGs we've had over the years. How many different games can fit on this list? Some like that I haven't even mentioned yet in passing, although I did kind of try to, like Planescape Torment, Dark Messiah, Might and Magic. There are so many games that are worthy of this list, and that's why I really want to know, what is your list? What are your top five RPGs of all time? And yeah, it's totally fine if it's really difficult to make the list. It's, I'm, you're not going to be graded on this exam. This isn't. It doesn't matter if your list is a completely eclectic list. If, if, if you basically just put Disco Elysium five times, fine. That's your favorite RPG and that's great. But let us know down in the comment section down below. In the meantime, if you want to know what some RPGs coming out soon, which actually may challenge your own top five list, games that I'm really, really hyped about that are launching this fucking year, including long awaited sequels, steampunk fantasy, and even, even a little bit of a surprise from a little tiny French studio that may be taking up that mantle from Bioware of the great CRPG with real time pause combat. You can see that in this video right here.